Join me in the reading of God's Word, reading from Luke chapter 20. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hand on him that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality and truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became quiet, silent. Our Father, we thank you for the brilliance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But far more than that, we thank you for the perfection of his life that can become ours by faith to think that we could have the experience of you looking on us and seeing only his righteousness. And yet that's exactly what the word teaches us can be true. As we come to you and accept you by faith. Our Father, we pray this morning that as we consider this passage of Scripture, you will speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Forbid it, Father, that we should go away the same that we came. Bring into our hearts by equal measures, the comfort, the conviction, whatever is needed to cause us to be looking more to you, to really be able to say in truth, I live to worship you. We long for that. We fall far short of that as we acknowledge. Here's one way that we can come closer. And so we pray, teach us by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated and uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 20 if you're not already there. You know, you can get knowledge in a lot of ways, right, in a lot of places. Universities all over the place, schools, television shows, all kinds of ways any way that anymore that you can pick up knowledge. But you know what? You can only get true wisdom in one place. One place. Very much neglected, even by those of us who claim that we believe in it. But it's only in the Word of God that we can get true wisdom. Proverbs 2.6, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. God's word equals wisdom. Wisdom, what do you do with the knowledge that you have? How do you interpret it? How do you use it? How do you apply it? How do you make use of it? I love what Mark Twain said one time, demonstrating that political issues are not new to our generation. He said, suppose that you were an idiot. And suppose that you were a member of of Congress. But then I repeat myself. I think God might rephrase that slightly and say something like this. Suppose that you are unwise and suppose that you are human. But then I repeat myself. Unwise is the way we're packaged. It's the way we come. That doesn't mean that you can't know a lot. Many of you here this morning know a lot. Many of you have been through years of education, but you can be brilliant and still lack true wisdom, right? When I, when I think of that, I always think of the old story about, uh, about Albert Einstein when he was teaching late in life, you know, at Princeton. He was known for his absent-mindedness, always thinking about the theory of relativity. How would you like to spend your whole life thinking about nothing but the theory of relativity? But apparently he did because, uh, because he was not able sometimes to function in the normal world. He called the office one day and asked for Dr. Einstein's address. Well, the secretary said to him, uh, Sir, I'm sorry, but uh, Dr. Einstein does not wish that information given out. So he said, uh, Well, listen, please don't tell anybody, but I am Dr. Einstein, and I'm headed home, but I can't remember where my house is. You can be brilliant and still lack the knowledge of your way home. Where's home? Home is where God is, beloved. 
we're made for God. God wasn't made for us. We were made for Him, and we were made to worship Him. We were made to glorify Him. We were made to bring glory to Him. And to the extent that we fall short of that, we not only fall, st- fall short of our potential, we fall short of the happiness and the satisfaction, the contentment that we could have in life. Home is where God is. That's why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without the relationship that that implies, it doesn't matter how many PhDs you have. You're without the wisdom that leads home. This passage is intended to help us find our way. As we saw last week as we began it, we saw that it contrasts two kinds of wisdom, human wisdom and divine wisdom. We saw that during the last week of his life, people are coming at Jesus from all directions. As he is teaching in the temple, the agenda is not always his. His enemies are doing everything they can to discredit him. And so they come flowing at him one after another, trying to find a way to discredit him, desperate to show him up, to make him look bad, to make him say something that would be wrong. But each person who comes and each group who comes goes away, shot down in flames like Wiley Coyote against the Roadrunner, right? Every one of them. His brilliance in this last week of his life is breathtaking. If indeed Jesus was not real, we should be worshiping the person who made this all up. Now last week we looked at three characteristics of human wisdom. Because we looked at the first part of this passage where the humans are coming against the divine and trying to make their case. And we find and we found that three characteristics of human wisdom are that they deny or disregard sin, downplay that, that they deify man, and that human wisdom devalues Christ. Today I want to look at the other side of that equation and look at what does human uh, what does divine wisdom look like? Uh, you know, this is for all of us, but I especially appeal to those of you who are young people. You're in high school. You're going to be in college one of these days. Understand these characteristics. It'll help you evaluate the knowledge that you're going to get there so that you can say, is this, is this knowledge compatible with the wisdom of God or is it not? So what are the, some characteristics of divine wisdom? Wisdom. Well, number one, divine wisdom exposes sin. If human wisdom tries to cover it over, disregards it, dismisses it, downplays it, denies it, divine wisdom lays it bare. The Word of God, part of the reason it's there is to lay bare the sin that exists in our lives. It doesn't do that to bury us under guilt. It does that because a God of love wants us to come to a point of turning away from that and turning toward Him. But in this passage, Jesus is brilliant in the way that He exposes the sin of those who are coming against them. These are coming, in this case, because they don't like the way that He has represented them in the parable that He's just told, the parable about the tenants. He's exposed them as those who are destroyers of his message, of God's message, and of God's messengers. He wants them to come to a point of repentance. Instead, they send new companions hoping to trap him. And so in verse 21, that says, They they come and they ask him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly, without partiality, but truly teach the way of God. You can just since their words dripping with honey, you know, as they try to take him in. But now comes the trap in verse 20, 22. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Now, this is not primarily a question about taxes in general, as is generally represented in this passage of Scripture. Tribute was a very small tax. It consisted of a tax of one denarius, meaning one day's wage for the average person in that day, one denarius per year per male person, 
as a recompense for allowing the Jewish people to keep the temple open. It was a tax that applied only to the Judeans, those who lived in southern Palestine, did not apply in Galilee in northern Palestine. Not where Jesus was from. But even though it was a small tax, this tribute, it was still a reminder of the subjugation of these people to their hated enemies. They were further reminded by the nature of the denarius. The denarius had a picture of Tiberius Caesar on one side of it. You saw it earlier up here on the screen. On the back side of that coin, it said Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus, which was a claim to divinity. By this time, the people had begun to, the, and with, with the encouragement of the emperors, had begun to think of their emperors as deity. Many Jews considered this, therefore, a violation of their law. And so the Romans had allowed them to mint their own coins. And so the Jewish people had coins that had, had images like the ears of corn, like uh, the leaves off of a vine, like the branches of a palm, a palm tree. Yet, yet the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, were still collecting this denarius so that they could protect their own existence. They were the temple keepers. So here comes the question. Is it lawful, by which the people would have understood and Jesus understood, they would be saying, is it lawful by God's law? Is it lawful for us, not for you, we know you're from Galilee, but for those of us who live down here in Judea, is it lawful for us to give this tribute? There's kind of an implication here. Jesus there implying as a non-Judean, could be objective about this hot issue. And so the trap is clear. If Jesus says, pay it, the possibility is that the people will in general turn against him because he's saying, pay your taxes. If he says, don't pay it, the possibility is that he would be looked upon as a dangerous insurrectionist in the eyes of the Romans, which of course is what they would like to have happen. One way or the other, they're sure they've got him trapped. Of course, they never do. Look at verse 23. But he perceived their craftiness. And so he said to them, show me a denarius. So let me ask you this question. Why didn't Jesus just pull a denarius out of his own pocket and hold it up and ask the question? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. One is that he didn't have a denarius in his own pocket. Jesus usually seemed to not have any money with him. When we few, few occasions when that seems to happen, uh, he doesn't have any money. But this has made a particular point here because Jesus is making a point. He wants these people who are coming after him to have to pull a denarius out of their pocket. Why? Because their question implies that nobody should be dealing in these denarius. He's revealing their hypocrisy. So they pull out a denarius, forgetting that their very, their, their very question implies they shouldn't be dealing in this kind of currency, and here they are showing that they've got it. They deal in it all the time. He's revealing to the crowd and to them themselves their own hypocrisy. He's revealing sin. He exposes sin. This is what Jesus does, not because he hates these people, but because he wants them to see themselves as God sees them. He's eliciting repentance. Divine wisdom always solicits repentance. Just like in the Garden of Eden, right? Human wisdom caused Adam and Eve to run from God. Divine wisdom called them back to God. Back to confession and back to repentance of who they were. This is divine wisdom. You know, one of the greatest obstacles, I think, to saving faith is the denial of who we really are. I mean, it's very hard, even the best of us, to really look at ourselves and, and acknowledge who we really are from the inside out. We just don't want to see ourselves as God sees us. A few years ago, there was an interesting um, news report that came out of Southern California where we were at the time. There was a, a lady named Jill Price who had this very strange uh, disease, rare condition called hyperthymesia. 
hyperthymesia. I've, I'd never heard of it before. It's a disease that meant that she remembered every single detail of her life from the time of age 14 on. The University of, of, Southern, of California actually spent six years with her evaluating, did she, is this really true? Does she really remember everything? And they would painstakingly go through her memories and then go back and try and check this out with other people, confirming that indeed she remembered everything that she had ever done from the age of 14 on. Now, at one level, that sounds like a good thing, right? And it was. She had a lot of good memories, warm memories of times past. But it turned out that Jill Price lived, because of this condition, a tortured existence. Because why? Because this good woman remembered every wrong thing that she had ever done, every wrong thought that she had ever had. She put it this way. She said, I feel paralyzed and assaulted by bad memories, peaceful sleep, is impossible. Can you imagine going to bed every night and you're just rehearsing your whatever you've done wrong over and over and over again. When it's so badly to say to her, you can have forgiveness. You don't have to live with this guilt. You can have freedom from this. But you know, it reminded me that a first step to coming to faith in Christ is to recognize who we are because what's our natural inclination? Our natural inclination is we suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Paul reminds us, words and actions that we don't want to remember. What a gift, perfect awareness of sin would be if it drove us to the cross, to the repentance and to the confession and to the forgiveness and the cleansing that's available there, would it not? But that's what the Word of God, the wisdom of God does. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder between the soul and spirit to tell us who we really are and then to tell, tell us, but there is a solution to the guilt that plagues you. So human wisdom denies sin. Divine wisdom exposes it. Secondly, and this one may surprise you, but divine wisdom esteems man. It esteems man. Perhaps that surprises you, but it's true. While, human, while divine wisdom insists on the reality of sin, it still esteems people. It still values them. It still assigns dignity to them, even in their unrepentant state. I mean, of course, a day of accountability is coming. But meantime, God gives man his due in hopes that he will turn to God. You see it here. In this case, Jesus says himself in verse, well, I'll get to that one in a moment, but Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, verses 44 and 45, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God is fair. God values us as human beings. But look how God, through Jesus, even respects a godless emperor in this case. Look at verse 24. Jesus says, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Jesus is not evasive here. Jesus says, pay the tribute. Now, the crowd isn't going to come out against him at this point in time, although within a day or two they will, but they don't now because he's also going to say something else, right? But he doesn't evade the issue. He says, pay the tribute. He duly recognizes human authority, even though... Think about this. Even though it is embedded in a man who is claiming deity to himself, the emperor. Even though it is embedded in a man who is one of the most licentious, evil, decadent men who ever occupied the position of Caesar. Tiberius was a real case. 
But Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Caesar is also responsible for the relative peace that exists in the world at this point in time. He's responsible for the roads that allow people to come and go. He's responsible for the court system that's set up. And he is responsible for the fact, in this case, that they can have worship in their own temple. So Jesus says, pay the tribute. Matthew 17 lets us know that Jesus paid his taxes. Pay the tribute. What's interesting to me is that those who are naturalists tend to look down upon the Christian view of anything. And yet it is naturalism which denies man of his dignity, insisting that mankind is just a higher level of animal. Divine wisdom sees dignity even in unregenerate people. Divine wisdom sees worth and value in human beings if for no other reason that they are all made in the image of God, right? You go back to Genesis 1, 1, or, uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're all made in the image of God. And because of that, there is value that attaches to human existence, value that attaches to human existence far above that of any other place in creation, far above that of any animal, far above that of any plant, as important as those things may be, mankind occupies a special place because they are made in the image of God. Furthermore, God has established, although man tries to tear it down, the great principle of authority and submission to create, a, to, to, to create order in human existence. There is the principle of authority and submission that exists in government, that exists in homes, that exists in wherever there is a need for organization, in the church. This is a great, beloved, this is a great principle of God. This just didn't come out of nowhere. The principle of authority and submission. And to the extent that we will not play by the rules that God has laid out, we will suffer. It is inevitable. We have classrooms now where they try and pull the teachers out. Let's just have you know, everybody in a circle and let's do whatever. It's, it's chaos because you need authority and you need submission to that authority in order to live properly. Listen to what Paul says, Romans 13. He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. In this broken, imperfect world, God sets up what he knows is best to bring about what his purposes are. And so he says, you resist authority of the human Authorities that God has put in your life, you're resisting the authority of God. Peter says something similar in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says, be subject to the, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and I remind you, Nero was on the throne at that point in time, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Here's Peter and Paul, both of those men, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, urging submission to the government that would eventually take their own lives. I defy you to find that in human wisdom. God is saying, you play by my rules and you will come out well. You play differently and you will suffer. Human wisdom believes that humans are the result of a meaningless evolutionary process, right? Right? Coming from nowhere, basically, and going nowhere with no meaning, no purpose, no dignity. Other than what we might artificially assign. That opens the door to all kinds of abuse, such as eugenics, genetic engineering, euthanasia, you name it, we have it. It's been there in history, and it is certainly there in our time. If man is just a machine, let's treat him like a machine. Attributing special value to mankind, it's a nice, comforting illusion, but it's nothing more than that. 
that kind of thinking that has led Francis Crick, who is one of the two discoverers of DNA, to suggest that if a newborn infant does not meet certain genetic endowment, its life should be terminated right then and there. Before you get too comfortable because you've passed that test so far, he's also suggested that everybody ought to be done by the age of 80 and we ought to just do away with you. Man is a machine, so let's treat him like one. Let's get the rubbish out of the way. This is naturalism, prophet. It's a far cry from what God says about the value and the worth of mankind. This is the thinking that has led to the murder of 60 million babies in our country since abortion was legalized in 1973. And you can, you can pit it any way you want to when it comes to abortion. You can call it whatever you want to, the fetus and whatever else. It has a heartbeat. It has a blood type that often is different from the mother's. It is a separate being. And it is murder to take its life. John Blanchard says this of his native United Kingdom. He said, It has been estimated that whereas the chances of being killed by a terrorist in this country are 1 in 420,000, the chances of being killed in the womb are 1 in 5. We now live in a world in which seals and whales have more legal rights than unborn infants. That's the result of human wisdom. Human wisdom, when it starts with the wrong presupposition, can do nothing except end up in the wrong place. Do you see? This is why we need our knowledge subject to the wisdom of God. Human wisdom, which on the one hand deifies humanity, on the other hand casts individuals on the rubbish of history. Meanwhile, God, in his human wisdom, now listen, God sent his own son to die, to pay the penalty for the sins of a humankind who were hopelessly lost so that they could have salvation. There's no greater love than that. There's no greater value that could attach to a life. How would it be if you saw a car coming down the road towards your child and you raced out and you pushed your child out of the way, but the car hit you? You've just given your life for something you thought was precious, right? God did no less, beloved. God assigns tremendous value because human wisdom understands human beings have great value because they are made in the image of God. All these other things that would take human life because it's inconvenient is the misconceptions of human wisdom and the misleading of human wisdom. So human wisdom, divine wisdom rather, exposes sin. It esteems people. It esteems man. Thirdly, it exalts God. Divine wisdom exalts God. This is really beautiful how Jesus does this here. Question in verse 22, is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? That question is structured in such a way as to suggest that you either have to honor Caesar or you have to honor God, but you, but you can't honor both at the same time. But look at Jesus' answer. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. He's saying this is not an either Caesar or God universe. This is a both Caesar and God universe. There's a place for both Caesar and God. But there's a priority, isn't there? The priority is always God. And when Caesar conflicts with God, then the priority is God. What Jesus is saying, listen, if you see Caesar's image on the coin that you use, he should receive his due for the privileges that he provides. He's allowing you to use your temple. Actually, Herod was building the temple for them. You should pay the tribute. 
But the implication here is something else. It's that God's image, if Caesar's image is on the coin, God's image is on the soul of every person who ever lived, right? God's image is on the soul of every person who ever lived. And if you should render into Caesar the things that are Caesar's because his image is on the coin, then, beloved, the, ob the obvious thing is that we should render into God the things that are God because his image is written on our soul. We are his by virtue of creation. The question is, will we be his by virtue of redemption? We are not our own. We have never been our own. We are God's. And so he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render to God the things that are God. Here's, here's the implication. Caesar has rights, right? We should render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but Caesar's rights are limited. He has no rights in God's domain. The Christian's first and overriding loyalty is to God. Peter says it this way. He says, you guys are aliens. Living in this world, you're, you're like aliens in a foreign land. You're not, you're not citizens here anymore. Your citizenship is in heaven, Paul says. That's the rules you ultimately live by. And when the rules of this earth conflict with the rules of heaven, we are duty-bound to obey the rules of heaven, right? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's up to the point where they conflict with God. But then when that happens, God prevails. There are definite limits to what Caesar can ask. There are no limits to what God can ask. For example, a believer must resist authority, whether it's coming from family, church, state, wherever, if it, if, if it, if it means violating a commandment or the character of God, Right? So the government may say it's okay to have your abortion. By the way, some of you here have probably had abortions. You know that God forgives that sin just as he does any sin. But no mistake that it's a sin. We have violated the character of God when we take a life like that. We must resist when asked to do an immoral act, whatever that immoral act is. They're now collecting in some places in our United States the sermons of preachers hoping to identify hate crime, which is basically just the representation of Scripture in order to intimidate and to cause us not to speak Scripture. What must we do? We must obey God. What did Peter say? You know, they arrested him in Acts chapter 4, right, for preaching the gospel and for saying that the Jesus that they had crucified was resurrected. They didn't like that. They said, you, you quit preaching that. Peter said what? We must obey God rather than man. So when there's a conflict, we must obey God. It's a great battle. It's been going on forever, right? The Apostle John had a, had a, he had a, young, he had a young disciple himself in Smyrna. You know, John ended up up, up there in, 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 in Ephesus and in kind of the uh, Asian area and what it was modern-day Turkey, around the seven churches that were up there in the time of, just after the time of Christ. And he had a, he had a young disciple named Polycarp. Well, by 155 A.D., Polycarp was now an old man. And Polycarp was the bishop in Smyrna, the pastor, in other words, of the church in Smyrna. And he was arrested for preaching the gospel because as, as Roman emperors came and went, some of them were kind of tolerant toward the gospel and many of them were not. Marcus Aurelius was Caesar by this time and he had issued this edict that Christians should be taken away and Polycarp was captured in the middle of this and he was brought into the arena before a proconsul, a Roman proconsul named Quadratus. Quadratus was doing this because he was required to by his, by his government, but he was really not very anxious to make a martyr out of this old man, right? And so as, as Polycarp was hauled into this arena before all these people, and Quadratus was out there, Quadratus said to him, Polycarp, you know why you've been called here. He said, if you will just recant your Christianity, I can let you go. Just say it isn't so. Polycarp politely refused. Quadratus reminded him, he said, Polycarp, under, you understand, I can have you burned at the stake if you, will not, if you will not do this, if you will not recant. 
Polycarp said this, he said, be that as it may, your fire will last no longer than an hour and then be quenched, but the fire that you face under God's judgment will never go out. Pretty bold, right? Quadratus said, Polycarp, just, just say away with the atheists. And what he meant by atheists was the Christians in Roman times were called atheists. Why? Because they didn't worship the Roman gods. He said, just say away with the atheists. And I love this. You know, Polycarp, the historians tell us, looked up at the crowd that was in the arena where he was being held. And he looked around for a moment, and then he waved his arms, and he said, okay, away with the atheists. Of course, he meant those who were not worshiping the true God. Quadratus was not amused. Still didn't want to kill this old man, but he was not amused. He said, listen, I'm going to give you one more chance. And he said, this is so simple. Everybody will hear. Will not blame me if you don't do what I'm going to ask you to do. He said, I just want you to say two words. Just say Kaiser Kurios, and I will let you go. Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. The famous answer that Polycarp gave to that was this. He said, for 86 years I have served Christ. In all those 86 years, he has never forsaken me, so how can I forsake him? You know, I wonder, would you have choked out those two little words if it was going to save your life? That's a serious question, isn't it? But it's a question, beloved, that we face every day, one way or another in our lives. Is it going to be Kaiser Kurios? Is it going to be Jesus Kurios? Jesus is Lord. Which is it? Polycarp refused. They lit the fire. Took his life. But Polycarp paid the ultimate price in order to gain the ultimate glory, didn't he? His fire was gone. Short time later, he was in glory. Quadratus, unless he somehow, somewhere along the line, came to faith in Christ, faced that everlasting fire. But I think the point for us is this, the, the, the decision in, that, that he faced in 155 AD is the same decision we face every day of our lives, right? Is it going to be... Is it going to be Kaiser Kurios? Are we, going to, are we going to live in accordance with the world's system around us? Or are we going to live in accordance with Jesus? Jesus Kurios. Jesus is Lord. Divine wisdom exalts God, beloved. Not anything or anyone else. Exalts God. Number four, fourth thing. Divine wisdom exudes authority. It exudes authority. This is a way to live. Jesus always knew who and what he was, didn't he? That breeds confidence. When you know who you are, and when you know what you're about, what your meaning in life is, you can stand when it's tough. You can be the person that God wants you to be. Jesus had that confidence his whole life. Listen to these words from Matthew 7, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Why could he do that? Why did he teach with an authority? And, you know, throughout the Bible, throughout the Gospels in the New Testament, you keep finding the, cl cl the crowds were amazed at his authority. Why? Why? Because he was in an absolute and total obedience to the Father. He knew he was doing the will of God. He knew he was living in accordance with divine wisdom. And divine wisdom exudes authority. It knows it has it right. I know people laugh at us and tell us nothing is certain. There's no truth that's true. And in ourselves, we don't have any more truth than anybody else. But this book has the truth. This book is the truth. And so we can stand with certainty of the divine wisdom of God. That's what Jesus was doing. It said, look at verse 26 of Luke 20 there. And they were, they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silenced. That's his critics that are marveling. 
They don't know what to do with him. They've never seen anything like it. This group gave up. We'll see next week a new group comes. They were marveling. Why? Because the authority driven by the wisdom of the word of God is authoritative. You know why? Because it's eternal. It's eternal. It's eternal. The truths in this book are forever. That's why we don't put anything above this book. Not the interpretations of the church, not the wisdom of mankind, not something else. It's the word. Go to the word. The word of God is truth that will live forever. What does Jesus say? Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. Immersion in God's word breeds confidence because it addresses it addresses the great issues of life for which human wisdom has no answers. I saw an interview, I don't know, it was a few years ago. There's a little-known pro golfer named Simon Dyson. I'm guessing even if you follow golf, you probably don't know his name. But he had done pretty well on the European tour at the time they interviewed her and interviewed him. And the reporter says, is there anything that you fear? Here's what he said. He said, yes, I fear death. I'm in a position now where I can do just about anything I want. Dying would not be good right now. I kind of wondered when dying would be good, but anyway, that was his statement. Dying would, wouldn't be good right now because I'm enjoying life too much. But dying is never good, right? And yet, and yet beloved, the funeral ambulance is right outside our house, isn't it? It's like, it's like the undertaker who signed every letter, you know, eventually yours. You're going to eventually be mine. Because that's what's waiting for all of us. And human wisdom has no answer. None. The answer, you know what the answer of human wisdom is? Get all the gusto you can. Because you only go around once. Great, but what do I do when the end has come? Jesus had the answer. He has the words of life. And the crowds are beginning to leave him. In John 6, he turns to his disciples and said, well, are you guys going too? Are you leaving as well? Remember what Peter said? Peter said, to whom are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So it's up to us to choose, right? Is it going to be human wisdom or divine wisdom? Where are we going? Got to go one way or the other. There's only two choices. Human wisdom or divine wisdom. Malcolm Mugridge, you know, the English, I don't know what you'd call him. He was a writer. He was a, you know, he was a, he was a bunch of stuff. But he said this in his book, Jesus Rediscovered. He says, education, the great mumbo-jumbo and fraud of the ages, purports to equip us to live and is prescribed as a universal remedy for everything from juvenile delinquency to premature senility. But for the most part, education only serves to enlarge stupidity, inflate conceit, and put those subjected to it at the mercy of the brainwashers with printing presses, radio, and television at their disposal. Okay, it's a pretty strong statement. If you're about to send your kid off to college, you may not want exactly that to be the idea, but do you see that's true? Knowledge without wisdom is exactly what he just said. Are you prepared? Are your kids prepared? Do we have wisdom? Is it divine wisdom or is it human wisdom? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder that the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding only from your mouth and we have that wisdom and that understanding in your word the question is will we pursue it will we believe it will we live it I pray this morning Father that we will see that anything that can be offered to us that doesn't stand up to the standard of your word is mere temporal folly. Only here can we find the, the answers to the questions of eternal value. Only here are the big issues of life and death and eternity addressed. 
Only here can we know for sure what it means to have eternal life, to have cleansing, to have forgiveness. Only here do we really know how to live even in this life. So help our hearts to pursue you. Or may our minds be transformed through the word so that we are like you. Thank you for this time. Lord, convict us again and teach us and help us to be changed as we go. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.